let's begin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our NXU Business Cage Challenge 2021 Grand Final. Warm welcome to our webinar participants and to those who are watching our Facebook live stream. By the way, I am Jamie, one of Nextbird's um, success advisors, and I am very honored to be your host for today's event. Over the past year, um, businesses across the world have suffered due to the global pandemic, as we all know. And at the same time, a number of other businesses have flourished and their sales have exploded. And in this competition that we will be witnessing today, we will see how our NXU business, uh, Masters of Business and Administration learners have put their own skills to work by creating a case study on how to future-proof a business of their choosing. Let me introduce you first to our panelists for today's competition. Our first panelist is an experienced management and mergers and acquisitions consultant, strategy and commercial due diligence from Deloitte, Mr. Zaid Salman. Our next panelist is a scholar practitioner that works in both business development and adult education, teaching students in practical application of business and leadership principles and curriculum across multiple industries. She has taught at four institutions at higher education and served as a leader in six industries, including e-commerce business, development, higher education administration, K-12 education, municipal government, and the United States Army. A visiting professor at Nexford University, Dr. Noel Kendrick. And our last panelist, but definitely not the least, is a scholar in the field of business, a well-versed researcher, international resource speaker, and a dedicated professor. He has over five years of experience in the higher education industry. He was the program head of BS Business Administration, assistant professor, and faculty researcher in one of the Philippines' top universities. Our very own teaching faculty, Dr. Michael Rodriguez. Okay. Now, let me quickly introduce you to our um, three top three finalists who will be competing for today's grand final. First, we have the CEO team with team members Chukwu Meka Ezike from uh, Nigeria, Sanbi Rio Meha from Indonesia, Onyinye Alili Udoye from Nigeria. Next up, we have the pandemic fighters with team members Ihab Lashin from Egypt, Kelvin Weyer from Nigeria, Alufemi Alunuga from Nigeria. And of course, we have the foremost crew with team members Innocent Ijioma from Nigeria, Lorigiana Menede from the USA, and Jude Okorharan from Nigeria. And now, to formally welcome us to the competition proper, may I call on Fadal Altarzi, Nexford's Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We're really excited to, to be hosting this uh, first of many uh, coming challenges. Um, you know, while it's been a tough year for everyone, equally from a business perspective, I think it's been exciting to see how the world has evolved and uh, how it's going to continue evolving. Just a quick background on the topic we have today. Um, essentially, we, we chose this topic to highlight, I'd say, the, the importance of skills such as adaptability and agility in the workplace. You know, the, the one constant going forward is going to be change. And the rate of change in itself is accelerating. To advance in business, one needs to be able to be prepared for change and really to master the ability to maneuver as needed. Um, you know, the old days we were all sort of obsessed with getting access to data. Today we have data overload, but in many ways, our ability to analyze data and to take informed decisions based on that data uh, rapidly is what's going to differentiate us in, in the business place or in the workplace. You know, there have been so many examples in history of companies who have not just successfully adapted to change, but even have, have pivoted completely. You know, some that come to mind are 
examples like Nintendo. You know, Nintendo started as a card selling business. Um, you know, YouTube started as a video dating site. Uh, Starbucks started as you know a business selling espresso machines. So you know, whether it's pivoting or adapting to change, it's a skill that's I would say in high demand today, higher demand than ever before, and definitely one that's going to remain in high demand regardless of the industry that you're in. Um, we saw tons of examples of businesses that moved online. Uh, and we also, unfortunately, saw many examples of businesses that didn't move online and therefore were unable to, to cope with the pandemic. So I really look forward to hearing from our different uh, you know, participants today and for future uh, business challenges. I'll hand back over to the team. Thank you, Amuj. Thank you very much, Fadl, for the insight that you have shared with us and for highlighting how relevant this competition is, not only for our MBA learners, but for everyone. So now, before we uh, proceed with watching the video entries of our finalists, let me share with you the criteria for judging. Okay. Criteria for judging, we have 20% added organizational value. This pertains to how significant is the provided solution or strategy to the stakeholders. Next, we have 20% operational and technological viability. The question is, is the proposed solution aligned with the operational and technological capacities of the organization? Next is, we have 20% financial feasibility. Is there evidence that the organization will survive financially by implementing the proposed strategy? Next, 20% distinctive competence. Does the strategy demonstrate a unique concept that will provide the organization with a competitive advantage? And of course, 20% for the overall quality of the presentation for a total of 100%. Now, I hope you're all ready as we will now showcase the video entries of our finalists. After each video presentation, the assigned panelists will ask the questions to be answered by the team members. And to begin with, let's have the presentation from the CEO team. Okay. Business chosen for the case, the healthcare system. Hi there. My name is Sandy from Asia. I am a part of the CEO team. Now, me and my other teammates, Emeka and Oni, will present our submission for the business case challenge 2021. The topic that we choose to present is how can we help the health care business in the future pandemic. Now, I'm going to explain to you about our executive summary. First is the background. Healthcare is supposed to be our main defense against any diseases that can trigger pandemic situation in the future. There are several reasons why we choose healthcare as our topic. First, as someone who works in medical business, I saw a lot of my friends got laid off, even recently. which estimated in 2020, 1.4 million healthcare workers got laid off. Second concern of mine is waiting for the test result is taking too long. I even experienced this myself. On the start of the COVID, this long wait reached up to seven days due to lack of supply and testing equipment. And the last one, is that 50% of world population lack access to healthcare, according to the World Health Organization. So what is our plan? So our plan is to introduce the Curie Hub, which is an app, a health ecosystem, and also a website that will help subscribers, which is the patients, pharmacy or drugstores, healthcare insurance organizations, healthcare educators, and also hospitals, 
and independent medical worker across the world. So what do we expect from this? First is increased care of coverage so patients can get the care they need. Second, more job opportunities for healthcare workers so those people who get laid off can work again. And the third one is readily available data for future outbreak prevention so we can prevent the pandemic even before it's happened. And the last one is helping healthcare businesses to gain more revenue. Next, I'm going to present our statement of problem. In 2021, the World Health Organization reported that essential healthcare services is still disrupted by COVID-19 in 90% of the countries worldwide. These countries that reported that 66% healthcare worker related reasons as the common cause of the service disruptions. So for example, they got laid off the job or they got sick and there's, there's lack of equipment, there's lack of health protocols. Secondly, there's millions of people that are still missing out on the vital health care and there's not enough provisions for day-to-day -day or primary care to prevent and manage of the common health problems such as diabetes or flu even, not COVID-19. And the last part is that 43% of these countries cite that, that health, their health care disrupted by their financial challenges that COVID disrupt. So what's going to be solution for this? Next, my teammate Oni will present about the objective of our app and our website. Uh, great everyone, I am Chukwe Emeke Iziki and I'm a member of the CO team here to tell you about our objectives and goal, proposed solution, uh, plan and proposed solution and uh, the factors we considered while implementing this project. Some of the objectives and goal we've uh, listed here will be one to try to help the uh, global population that have no access to the world uh, to health services which is a uh, stated to be half of the world, creating more revenue of, of income for practitioners and hospitals and reducing the kind of wrong information spread, creating panic during pandemic or healthcare escalation, making healthcare insurance more available to the larger populace without affecting their financial situation. And we'll be doing this by creating an online hub for health service that will onboard the medical uh, practitioners and hospitals, healthcare educators, pharmacy and drug stores and health insurance organization, including subscribers. And this will be ensure that uh, for, for, for health service to be available to the larger one, uh, populace and increase the growth and uh, scalability of this using this online hub uh, proposal. And we're looking to deliver on this by having an operational team in house that would handle the standard of body process for subscribers, in house consultation personnel, and delivery drugstores prescribed by medical personnel, which will be done by the drugstores, which will be on body, creating an educational system whereby people get access to right common practices uh, education. Uh, for healthcare uh, situation and will redistribute insurance by onboarding insurance firm to make this available at a more affordable plan that could easily be spread out, uh, according to uh, standard of people in different location and hi there my name is Sandy from try to help the uh, global population that have no access to the world uh, to health services, which is uh, stated to be half of the world, creating more revenue of, of income for practitioners and hospitals and reducing the kind of wrong information spread, creating panic during pandemic or healthcare escalation, making healthcare insurance more available to the larger populace without affecting their financial situation. And we'll be doing this by creating an online hub for health service that will onboard the medical uh, practitioners and hospitals, healthcare educators, pharmacy and drug stores, and health insurance organization, including subscribers. And this will be ensure that uh, 
for, for, for health service to be available to the larger one uh, populace and increase the growth and the uh, scalability of this using this online hub uh, proposal. And we're looking to deliver on this by having an operational team in-house that would handle the standard of body process for subscribers, in-house consultation personnel, and delivery drugstores prescribed by medical personnel, which will be done by the drugstores, which will be on body, creating an educational system whereby people get access to right common practices uh, education uh, for healthcare uh, situation and will redistribute insurance by onboarding insurance firm to make this available at a more affordable plan that could easily be spread out uh, according to uh, standard of people in different location and well articulated looking at the situation will be concerning factors to ensure that this proposed plan is actually well articulated looking at the situation of fake doctors and uh, of, uh, of substandard medicine which has been spread across some regions so how we've been doing this we'll be avoiding onboarding illegitimate health practitioners by ensuring that we go through internal process that screens those people to verify their certifications as personnel or as institutions and also we'll be doing this to ensure that the uh, insurance company are compliant and uh, are free from every form of insurance fraud and all that and we ensure that we onboard drug stores that have been verified or approved by their region to practice or service uh, that need in the public to the populace and also ensure that we have an internal legal team that is going to verify all the documentation and go through the process to ensure we have the best documentation that is of global standard and thank you for listening as I forward this, I pass this to my other team member Onyi to continue the presentation. Thank you. Hi, I am Onyi Nye. I'll, I'll be speaking on implementation plans, cost and revenue analysis, and the expected outcome. For the implementation plan, the focus will be on five core areas that are more like the pillars required for the solution to kick off. These are the technology, data, processes, partnership, and marketing. The next slide explains what's required for implementation around these areas. For the technology, we are looking at acquiring the necessary infrastructure, which includes the servers, domain name, and software licenses. The development of the core platform, Kure Hub, will also be handled here. This will be developed both as an app and a website ecosystem. Next is data sourcing. One of the core features of the solution is data analytics and prediction, as this will aid some subscribers in preventing certain health issues from occurring. So data around medical records, subscriber demographics, weather records, etc., will be sourced and uploaded into the hub once ready. Partnership is also a key area the solution will rely on in order to succeed. So there's a need to source for partners, which includes drugstores, independent medical practitioners, hospitals, health insurance companies, etc. Next is process design. There will be need to design the process around onboarding of partners, including background checks, training of independent medical practitioners on solution usage, as well as setting monitoring and complaint handling processes. Then marketing, which is very critical in getting the solution into the market, various channels will be used to achieve this. For our implementation plan, we recommend a 10-month implementation window for the solution to ensure readiness of the core areas. This timeline shows that technology area will be the first to be kicked off with a projected platform development of five months. This is around the average time it takes to develop similar apps. The other areas kicks off at different intervals as the project progresses and these areas will continue even after the launch of the solution. Next is cost and revenue projection. We projected a cost of $20,000, which will be used for the platform development, infrastructure and services acquisition, marketing and operations expenses. It's also key to note here that the partners will bear any costs in the implementation. 
for the revenue, which is a shared model, we projected a total revenue of $1 million in the span of three years. This was derived from, the, from targeting 0.1% of the global healthcare revenue, which stood at $1.85 trillion in 2018 at a 1% transaction fee on Career Hub. So the revenue will be split among the business and the partners. Upon launch of this solution, what success looks like for us is to see a reduction in hospital visits. This will give the medical personnel in hospitals enough time to cater for more severe cases and possibly have enough time to attend to those affected by a future pandemic, while Prehop takes care of other basic ill health through the platform. Next is increase in job opportunities for trained med medical personnel that are out of jobs and to also see increase in the number of people that have access to healthcare. This also speaks to the sustainable development goal number three. Another expected outcome is increase in revenue for both Kure Hub and her partners. The next slide shows the references cited and the appendix. Okay, we have now with uh, we have uh, just witnessed the presentation of the CEO team. Now may I call on the members of this team to turn on their videos so we can proceed with the um, live Q and A session. May I re may I invite um, Sandy Rio? We also have we also have um, Chukwumoka Ezike and then Onyinye Udoye. Kindly turn on your um your video so that we can see you on our screen. And then for the question and answer, this will be led by our um, one of our panelists, Dr. Michael Rodriguez. Okay. Sandy, Choku, and Onini, can you turn on your videos, please? We cannot we can't find actually the find the video option. Okay, let uh, it me. Could be, it could be the only an, only panelists uh, are maybe can turn on the video. So maybe they could just do audio only. Okay, that's no problem. Let's just proceed with the audio then. Okay. Okay, I'm giving the floor to Dr. Michael for the question and answer. Hi, team. Uh, congratulations for making it to the top three. Um, so with your uh, Cure Hub, I think, is it a CR CRM platform or is it going to be used for all of the, uh, the functions and departments inside the healthcare? Hello, the question wasn't really clear. Would you please repeat the question again? Sorry. Um, since this is an app uh, looking at many uh, facets and components of the organization or the healthcare, is it going to be a CRM platform to be developed for the customers only or other departments as well of the organization? Yeah, so it's going to be both for the customers and other department of the healthcare sector. As mm -hmm. uh, you see, yeah, there is going to be like uh, a way we collect data from both parties to ensure that we help uh, the future references for data for prevention of certain health issues. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, since there is a proliferation of using mobile apps in, in many businesses, particularly healthcare as well, I would just like to know how is it going to be different? How is it going to, to, uh, to future-proof the healthcare system amidst this pandemic? I, I would like to really know the specific rationale how it's going to be different from other applications or other practices that healthcare, healthcare are already practicing now. So uh, with the partnership who already has uh, witnessed uh, the pandemic issue and created a proof system to deliver, we're working with those people okay. on a global rate to help them bring the service to people regionally. It's gonna be dual regional. So in this way, that means uh, you can still operate during pandemic because people will still have access to the internet 
and be able to communicate with the healthcare need through the platform and get the necessary uh, verticals needed. And for delivering some services, there should be, uh, you know, it's going to be like uh, no contact delivery for some medical supplies. And, mm -hmm. you know, so all this is going to be embedded in the app to make sure that logistics still keeps going on and a healthcare situation doesn't come at a full stop during a pandemic. Right, good, thank you. And another question is, I, I saw that um, one of the outcomes that you're looking at is basically the reduction in number of patients visiting in the hospital. And what are you going to do or how are you going to address those uh, consultations that may require lab tests? Do you, are you going to, to also have an, an add-on wherein you can book another appointment for a physical or face-to-face -face visit? because I think it was not covered by, by the case, but it was part of your statement of the problem. So, yeah, to, okay. to ask, okay, go ahead. Doing. Okay, um, let me take that. Thank you for the question. So it's part of um, what we considered. Now the app um, is like an ecosystem. Just um, think about Uber for healthcare, you know, where we have um, medical practitioners as well. So one of the features of the app is that there's an in-app consultation service, yeah, where you can have the medical personnel can interact with the patients. But of course, there are some cases where maybe tests need to be carried out. So that's where um, an appointment will need to be booked, where the medical personnel can visit the patient's house to take um, whatever is required for the test. So it's part of what um, we considered in the whole strategy. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before I end my, my part, I, I would just like to make a suggestion um, in, in writing some of the, um, in improving the case, uh, particularly in this topic, I think we have to identify first the main problem, aside from the three, three statements of the problems that we identify, we have to, to identify the main first so that our st st strategic courses of action would be more concrete and it, ha it would be aligned and all of our resources would be properly redirected, okay? So, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, team. Thanks. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Dr. Michael. May I call on Dr. Noel Kendrick for any additional um, questions that you have for our um, team members? Sure, yeah. Thank you so much. And congratulations. Great job on this presentation uh, and this project overall. Uh, I would like to ask, do you think, let me see if I can bring my camera on actually, and unfortunately I do not have um, my background set up, but I would like to be able to see the kinds, okay. Um, do you think that this would be used for something uh, more in the private sector or something that is possibly um, more aligned to public sector healthcare? What do you think? So, okay, Sandy, you want to take that? Hi, so I'm the one who works in the healthcare industry okay. so i know all of this uh these things right right now i'm working in there so we both currently thinking about partnering with both public and private so both of public government and the private government can benefit from this actually yeah okay and so it seems like a f more of a full erp system than just the crm um so you're thinking that both the government and private entities would have access to the system at the same time to be able to share records and information about patients correct 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 that's true interesting and then it makes the patient easier for the patient so if you go somewhere else i mean like if you go to the private then the next day you go to the public hospital you have your data all recorded, then you're good to go. Very good, very good. Um, what do you see in terms of regulation for such a system? Um, would that be a private company that regulates and monitors that, or would the government play any role in that? Um, okay, so, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so for the regulation, yeah, because um, what we are talking about here is um, data of patients right so it's not something um, that we can leave in the hands of some private individuals so yes the government will have a part to play because mm -hmm. um it's something that um can't be left out there for anybody to have access to so yes the government will be involved heavily in this in terms of regulating the entire system that will also make the patients to have some kind of comfort you know in their having their data secured 
Great. Okay. One last question I have. Um, one of the uh, topics that was covered here was wanting to avoid counterfeit medications and false doctors um, and just making sure that there's greater regulation there. How would you connect that piece to this technological system? So let me take that. So currently there are uh, um, verified people who handle uh, drug verification, especially in my region, whereby you have scratch ID numbers attached to drugs to identify fake drugs and uh, no wishes fake. So we're going through those institutions as partners to plug in uh, either through their APIs to be able to draw out this verification process attached to, to the app. Okay. Okay, that is all of my questions. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Team CEO, for uh, your presentation. So just to recap, they have presented an application to be used for both the public and the private um, hospital sectors. And you know what, thank you so much for the idea that you have just shared with us. We're very excited to see this you know, uh, becoming real in the future. And once again, thank you. And now, we can just uh, we can uh, probably move on to the next presentation. This presentation is from our um, second team that is the um, pandemic fighter. So let me go back to sharing my screen so you can uh, see my presentation. Hello there. This is Pandemic Fighters presentation of the next Ford University Business Case Challenge, Building a Pandemic Proof Business. Our topic is on hospital business supply chain disruption during the pandemic uh, caused by COVID-19. The contents that we'll be going through will include introduction of our team members, uh, executive summary, statement of the problem, objectives, alternative causes of action, and then the recommendation um, at the end of the day. But let's start with meeting our team members. I want to introduce to our team members. I have Ea Blashim as a member of the team, an architect and CEO of Nile Diagnostic Africa. I have Kelvin Weir, an engineer and a digital marketer as part of the team. I'm also part of the team, Olufemi Lunuga, I'm a pharmacist and an educator. I'll start with the executive summary. That's my next slide presentation. In terms of the executive summary, uh, we, we try to present an overview of the case, uh, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, the hospital-based business worldwide. In fact, COVID-19 is an outstanding event, event that impacted every country, every business that you can think of, and supply chains and globally. And that includes uh, the hospital-based business. And so a pandemic is a widespread epidemic. It covers nation, it covers the world in terms of its impact. So the hospital business is always affected first in any pandemic. Let, let's go to the next slide in terms of defining the problems. Um, problem statement. I want to actually talk about the problem statement. Uh, the global shortage of medical supplies and devices are the problems we are looking at both in private and public hospitals due to uh, the global pandemic caused by COVID-19, which has led to the death of close to 4 million people as at July, 2021. And many of whom could have been saved, assuming there were enough medical supplies and devices. And the 2020 financial loss of over 300 billion US dollars by the American hospitals alone. And that's huge. And so, Let's try to quantify the problem. I, I, I've just shown a few slides in terms of uh, analyzing quantitatively uh, the problems. Uh, we have human resources loss in the hospital setup or healthcare uh, uh, industry worldwide. Then the next one in, is in terms of the financial impact uh, on hospitals. Take, for example, the USA uh, hospitals I mentioned earlier on huge financial impact on the United States of America hospitals, uh, which cuts across uh, total revenue losses due to canceled uh, surgeries and other services. 
Additional costs associated with uh, purchasing needed PPEs and what have you, a uh, cost of uh, additional support for the hospital workers and, and what have you. That's just the financial implications to the hospitals, whether individual hospitals or uh, global hospitals or the public or private hospitals. Then the global economic impact is the next slide. In terms of the global economic impact, uh, schools were closed, uh, uh, economies were run into downtowns, uh, there were new poor people emerging on the scene globally, millions were without meals, uh, so many global impacts. Now the objectives of our presentation. What are the objectives? We want to actually talk about identifying the challenges. We want to talk about uh, connecting uh, the, uh, the strategies uh, 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 to the challenges in terms of pro uh, proposing strategies. Uh, we want to talk about uh, proposing actions uh, in terms of implementation for the things that we can do and then link them up to the identified challenges. In terms of identifying uh, the challenges, uh, but that we came up with certain uh, aspects. So let's look at the slide in terms of identifying challenges. One, we, we discovered that there were bottlenecks uh, uh, in terms of uh, checkpoints and, 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 and trucking uh, bottlenecks that slow down deliveries of critical supplies, especially during the lockdown. Uh, there were also lack of uh, human resources. Workers were out of work because of sicknesses uh, or they were slowing up, uh, they were slowing down work. Uh, they, were, they were not showing up. Uh, we are talking about healthcare workers. Uh, uh, there were also export bans, uh, low resilience, uh, panic buying, uh, fuel sourcing uh, of, of PPEs and these medical supplies. Uh, uh, there were no transparency also. There was lack of transparency in terms of uh, some government agencies in terms of giving uh, current and uh, information so that uh, pro proper follow-up could be done. There was also poor coordination. These were some of the identified challenges. Let's go to the alternative causes of action, which will actually express uh, some of the solutions we want to profile. The first one is the use of technology. Um, talking about technology, uh, we are talking about using robot robotics in manufacturing these ventilators, robotics in manufacturing these oxygen uh, uh, devices, uh, and what a view, even PPEs. Uh, we are looking at the supply chain system, having things like the blockchain in, in the supply chain system. We are looking at uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence uh, so that this could actually help in monitoring uh, the movement of stock and how stocks are reducing or coming down so that there could be replenishment on time. In terms of technology, we are looking at things that Google came up with some years past uh, in terms of uh, the Google flu. In 2008, Google launched Google flu, which was meant to actually monitor the rate of the spread of influenza around the world so that it can predict responses to such disease conditions. We could have such uh, even at this point in time. Also, we are looking at uh, building supply chain redundancy so that we could have a, a supply chain resilience uh, uh, by adding extra inventory of critical items uh, to the supply chain, I mean, to the inventories uh, of, of these uh, medical devices uh, and in terms of moving through the supply chains. We are looking at creating inventory holistic view uh, so that each organization, the individual hospitals, uh, and government-based hospitals and what have you uh, could actually look at uh, reviewing the inventories uh, by creating a holistic view of all the medical supplies. We are looking at, uh, at greater upstream uh, uh, visibility by mapping and monitoring the supply network through um, locating the first and the second tier suppliers uh, and understanding the inbound of materials and the outbound of products. We are looking at diversifying suppliers, like I said earlier on in our introduction, you know, GE General Electric went into manufacturing ventilators. What about just diversifying suppliers for these uh, uh, medical supplies that were in shortage? We are looking at achieving network agility so that there could be faster responses uh, to issues. Uh, we are looking at raising public awareness uh, so that there could be actually the reporting of incidences uh, of pandemic faster than what we have during COVID-19. But we have rendered solutions. What about the implementation? So the next slide talks about recommendation and implementation. In this, we are looking at public policy recommendations, and we are also looking at capacity and capability recommendations. In terms of public uh, uh, policy recommendations, we are looking at research to the low socioeconomic groups uh, who struggles had during crisis like COVID-19 pandemic, uh, using economic of scales while purchasing medical supplies, uh, 
uh, and what have you. And these are some of the things that we are looking at in terms of the public policy recommendations. Uh, we are looking at the use of economic of scales uh, of purchasing medical supplies, equipment, testing kits, PPEs, and what have you, approaching the pandemic uh, with a collective uh, local and, and then global uh, approach in terms of transparency and visibility to help the loss of human beings worldwide. And we are also looking at driving it to individual hospital-based businesses uh, like public and private sectors uh, should join hands uh, to uh, actually improve public health per capita spending versus treatment per capita spending. We are looking at public and private hospitals improving sourcing from alternative suppliers uh, and, and stop relying on cost uh, uh, reduction for inventory uh, so that there, can be, there could be reliability in terms of stockpiling of critical items uh, identified for such, cri for such crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. We are looking at both healthcare systems and healthcare uh, uh, chain systems uh, are being exposed to stress tests so that the frequency and resource could actually be declared uh, um, uh, uh, publicly and then there could be ways to manage such. And thank you very much for listening. In terms of my appendix, uh, the appendix slide, uh, I want to say that here, Blashin conducted research on, on this content and did slide designs that uh, Kelvin Weyer conducted research on the content, provided technological input. I also did, I mean, conduct research on the content and I collated the slides into a presentable unit and did the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for the presentation of our second group, and that is from our pandemic fighters. So right now, may I call on the members of the group, um, Ihab Lashin. We also have um, Olufemi Olunuga. So um, please um, kindly turn on your videos. And we also have um, Kelvin Aware if he's here with us. And for the Q&A, this will be, um, the first question will be asked by our guest. Do we have um, Zaid Selman in the call? Okay. So let me call on first um, Dr. Noel Kendrick for the, uh, for, um, for her questions for this pandemic fighters team. Hi, Noel, you're currently on mute. Let me or... unmute, sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. Um, so, you know, very good job. Congratulations. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask about, um, you know, this seems like a process improvement plan with a lot of people and elements involved. Um, similarly to our last team with uh, government and, um, you know, private companies and, and, you know, the private sector together. Um, who do you think would own this process? Uh, and really get it started because we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about you know supply chain creation within the, within our you know our own regions now, and then looking outside of it. Who's going to own these processes and get this started? I think there should be a committee uh, that is uh, that is uh, consists of uh, government people, uh, the uh, big uh, the big uh, OEMs. Uh, like uh, Philips, GE, Siemens, whomever have the uh, people from the research sector, it would be a quite big uh, committee uh, that should be uh, backed up with the government's uh, approvals mm -hmm. and uh, seeing everything in place uh, to to uh, to to help the policymakers do these things uh, together, working on that, so we can achieve the uh, the uh, the success on this part. Okay. Um, the mention of AI uh, for improvement in different medical processes and within the hospitals and whatnot. Could you explain just a little bit more about what you would be using in terms of AI? Yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, the big data will will collect uh, uh, will will give us a, a good picture about screening people, uh, you know, in the airports and in the in the f fastness of the of the assessing of the uh, of uh, uh, any patients or uh, or uh, anyone who could be uh, uh, carrying COVID. Uh, 
through his uh, uh, bio, uh, his biosign uh, science. This first one. The second one is uh, the use of uh, 3D printing could help a lot in this because also you know uh, accelerating the the uh, small uh, small manufacturing uh, issues like uh, uh, whatever hoses needed. Uh, uh, face masks, uh, uh, there are small parts in the ventilators and all the things that could be uh, uh, halting and could be could help uh, stopping the infection. Even sometimes uh, there are people who succeeded in doing a whole ventilators through the uh, 3D printing. So the AI, the AI will, will help in, in this in this terms, 3D printing, uh, taking the uh, bioscience uh, and, and acting on the big data. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. I'll let the next panelist ask. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Noel. May I now call on Dr. Michael Rodriguez for any follow-up questions for our pandemic fighters? Thank you, Jamie. Hi, team. Uh, once again, congratulations for making this far. I would agree with Noel that this case really focused on many elements. There were many elements mentioned as supply chain is really big, you know, it, it really covers the analysis, planning, marketing from pr procurement to logistics up until to the successful operation of any organization, not just in hospital. But uh, I would like to focus more on the technicality of the case and the, the analysis made. I've seen that there were nine challenges identified during That's your right. presentation. I would just like to know, how were you able to, to identify those nine challenges? What were your basis or did you use different data or analytics for you to know that these are the, the nine challenges that we must focus on? Or did you use a particular organization to benchmark with? Uh, actually, we, we used the, uh, the command of research, number one. The second thing was that we have uh, we have through our observation is that you know the, the supply chain is affecting every aspect in the world it affects even our presence together here so when you see uh, the nine uh, uh, aspects was like uh, uh, the direct uh, effect to the to the to the business uh, i mean uh, like uh, if you if you are if you are if you are seeing like when you when you when you want to have some uh, uh, order for ventilators, so of course the the halting of the uh, uh, of the uh, exporting is one of the is the of the challenges. Sometimes when you already get the order and it is it is there, it could be stopped in a bottleneck in a, in a in a port or in an airport or something, and that was all due to the uh, COVID. Uh, the, uh, and, and people should talk to each other. You know, the, when the COVID hits, it also addresses the, the discommunication between systems in an intra-company and, and, or an intra-country and even around the world. So some people are saying, no, we are not getting any goods out of the, out of the, the port because it would be infected. Come on, guys, this could be infected. But at the end of the day, this ventilator will save lives of people. So communication and, and also integration of all systems together, uh, intra-country and, and around the world is very important. This is how we analyzed from the very uh, bottom, how things is getting hard, uh, how, you call, uh, how you could call a pharmacy and say, I need some Panadol. And they said, it's not there uh, because it was bought by excess buying from people or it was not uh, supplied. Uh, it was not supplied by the by the uh, suppliers because of its uh, halted in the ports, and that's it. This is the base of our research because when you hit the base, you found things are piling up. So it piles up through our experience uh, and uh, through the research we have made over uh, this. All right, please. Can, can I just add um, a, a point too? So what uh, he sure. have said, Sorry, I don't know uh, if, uh, yeah, please. Okay, okay. So uh, what we did is okay. So I was just going to add to that. I don't, I don't know if you can hear me. What? Maybe if we can okay. have all of Femi first, and then we'll have Kelvin afterwards. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> first. 
All right, all right. So what we what we did was actually to conduct the research, actually to also observe and then take an holistic view of the industry as a whole from the point view of a consultant. Our presentation has so many elements and presentations of um, uh, solutions because we actually uh, stood at the vantage point of being a consultant uh, to view the whole system uh, of the uh, healthcare industry and then begin to bring in points. So uh, we looked from the point of the hospital-based business and individual hospital business and then moved from that point uh, to other things that connect with that individual hospital business and brought in a whole lot of um, solutions that could help that individual hospital business. So it's going to be a cooperative uh, work in terms of implementing uh, our solutions. So what we did, our presentation is actually based on um, uh, projecting ourselves as consultant um, to, to getting uh, solutions to the hospital-based business that was actually affected by the pandemic. Calvin. Um, just to add to what Olufemi just said, we noticed that, you know, there were there are a lot of there are healthcare hubs. The problem wasn't that there were no healthcare hubs or there were no meditech companies. There were all these things. The problem was that they didn't just know what to do when the pandemic hit them. So that was the problem. They didn't just know how to take their business forward. They didn't just know how to cope with the pandemic because it was alien to a lot of businesses, right? So we said we're going to position as pandemic fighters. This is, you're going to need us for your business, basically. And that's what we want to do. So we're going to offer solutions. That's why our presentation was like theory, a lot of research and solutions. Basically, that's where it was, that's what drove our case study. So we want to partner with these people. So it could be very, very complex in the sense of how we're going to do all these things because we are identifying nine problems, but that was not the aim. The aim was to, you know, I'm going to speak to a tech company and say, yeah, this is a solution for you. This is where you should be. This is what you're going to be doing. We're going to speak to health orbs like the guys that presented earlier and say, hey, you have a fantastic product. This is what we're going to do. This is what our research, this is what our research says, and this is what you can do from it. This is a solution that we're preferring to you to go on with the pandemic and to thrive as a business, even during the pandemic era. So that's what our, our business is focused on. So it's heavily research-based and heavily um, um, solution you know, driven, basically. That's where we're coming from. Thank you, guys. I love how this is solution-based and research-based, which leads me to uh, my question. Since there are many elements covered, there were a couple of solutions presented as well, and some of the implementations were covered. I just, I would just like to know what what are the different success parameters that you are use, that that you're going to use for for these solutions and implementation, how would you know that you are being successful with, with addressing all of the, the challenges that you have identified? Okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go first and then I want you to come in too. Uh, what what um, solution looks to us in terms of um, mm -hmm. indicators of uh, success is uh, for example, uh, with technology, uh, we are going to be able to have feedback. Um, AI will give us feedback, of course, driven on machine intelligence. So we are going to have data. And so we can actually analyze this data from the point of view of the technology. And then we can be able to say, okay, uh, this is the feedback, the information we are getting. Take for example, uh, the Google uh, flu that was introduced in 2008. If we have something like that, uh, during the season or in any pandemic uh, um, um, period, pre-pandemic period, we can be able to actually have information ahead, uh, predictive mm -hmm. information that can help us to strategically position ourselves. And so each individual hospitals uh, worldwide will be incorporated, uh, a government uh, will be incorporated, the World Health Organization will be incorporated, and then we'll be monitoring how we are having certain um, prevalent diseases uh, like we said for the goggle flu influenza, monitoring such. So for example, that's the way we are going to do, I mean, go. Then we begin to look at, um, for example, we mentioned redundancy in terms of these um, uh, medical devices uh, and uh, PPEs in the supply chain system. We meant that there should be, you know, most of the uh, storage are at the source, production source. Why don't we have through the supply chains, we can have certain form of redundancy in, in the sense that we'll keep 
certain part of this top. So they are already part of the supply chain system. So if there's anything that would happen, uh, we can quickly respond. That's why we talked about agility in network. And so we are going to, of course, be monitoring what will be um, at those uh, points of the supply chains in terms of uh, these uh, medical supplies and the PPEs. We are going to be monitoring them. There should be a, st a stock level, a minimum stock level that actually should be you know, uh, monitored uh, consistently. And then, of course, uh, there are other parameters that will be measured too that will actually indicate success to us. Uh, I, I want here have to actually uh, come in and mention some other points. Thank you. I, I think uh, Kelvin has uh, something to say. Uh, no, I, I'll lower my hand. So Ihab can go, please. Okay. Uh... As, as Olufemi have covered uh, most of the points that uh, I, I hope he answered your question, I just like to add something is that in our presentation in the in the course of action, uh, it was very well clear mentioning how every course of action would cover uh, some of the of the uh, of the problems that we have faced we, we are facing. Like if we, we revise the presentation, you will find, each and every one is covering and addressing some solutions. However, at the end, we, we, we find that uh, uh, we have uh, things in the, two, two things, the, the, for, one for the public policies and one and some set, other set for the capacity and the, and the, uh, uh, and the uh, capability. So that's the final. I mean, this is as, as they say, this is the creme of the creme after you, you skim everything and see how the, this could be addressing and how this could uh, solve the problems uh, during the pandemic. So we gathered each uh, three of the, of the two, three recommendations to the policymakers and another three recommendations that could help uh, the capacity and capabilities of any organization. Uh, and one core of them is the integration, the integration between the organizations, public organizations and, and NGOs and also uh, uh, the governmental organizations. The integration is one uh, uh, crucial element that will help uh, uh, in solving any uh, future pandemic problem, especially for the healthcare supply chain and the hospital business. Just to add briefly, we cited that financial loss was a big problem. So basically, when we're dealing with these healthcare sectors, their books are going to tell us our results, basically. So you see that oh, when the pandemic started, there was a dip in your finances. There was a dip. You were, not, you were unable to you know, reach the financial goals that you set for yourself. But now that we've set in with you, we've provided our solutions to you to make your business work. Now you can see like there's a difference now in your financial, in your finances as a business. So that way we're able to tell our progress and our input as you know, a company that is working and doing a good job. Thank you guys. Um, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our team pandemic fighters who have shared with us a more holistic approach in terms of uh, identifying solutions for specific um, concerns that we might experience in the healthcare industry. So now let's move forward to our um, final. Oh, I think we still we also have another uh, question from one of our panelists. Maybe if I, if I can call on um, Dr. Robin Johnston to add any final questions for our um, uh, finalists. Sure. Thank you, Jane Pan. Great job, guys. Great job uh, on doing this. So you talk about all this integration and you talk about all the different stakeholders and all about communication. How are you going to really develop buy-in between all these individuals plus on a global stage? And second part of that is you have the nine components of it. So I think of that as Kind of if, if you think of a wheel, there's one core problem driving this issue. So as you go to the stakeholders, how are you going to define that core problem with the other eight um, integrating together? 
Okay, uh, the, the core problem, let me start with the last question. The core problem is actually the uh, shortage in the supply of medical supplies. Um, uh, you have the ventilators, uh, oxygen uh, cylinders, and then the PPEs. And it affected a whole lot of, uh, all the different kind of angles that we covered in the hospital-based business. So that's our core. And so if we are gonna actually go to uh, the policy makers to interact with uh, these groups of people, we are actually going to communicate with them in the sense that we can uh, provide something, like I said, and help like the goggle flu or something like that we can all use to communicate that can bind us together. Take for example, if we have that goggle flu harp or something in that regard that can monitor like whatsoever you are actually experiencing in your own region, you put it on board. That's okay, in my own hospital uh, based business, maybe I'm in Nigeria, I'm running a XYZ hospital. I'm having more patients coming in with influenza cases. Is that the case in Japan? Is that the case in China? So we can communicate. So it's going to be that technology. That's what we mentioned earlier on. And so we can now begin to have feedbacks. So we can have feedbacks, we can have recommendations, and then we can actually bridge the gaps in terms of communication. That's just an example, though. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I don't have I, any other. related to that also? Sure. Okay, so basically, you know, the way every company has, um, you want marketing, you get like a, a marketing agency that does, you know, they do the real work for you. So you want SEO management, they do SEO, you know, um, um, search engine optimization for you and you can, they can find yourself. Like no company has to do all this by themselves. So we are saying, you know, we're going to come in for you. We are, we are heavily driven on technology. So imagine um, the government, I'm going to give you a very good example. The government, we're having shortages of ventilators, right? And then... But they don't, they have what they have what they have, but they don't know how to manage the resources they have during the pandemic. So we are saying, okay, let's give you a solution like a real-time monitoring of ventilators. So instead of taking people who have, you know, um, um, the virus to so hospitals where all the ventilators are occupied, we have a real-time monitoring of those your equipment. And we are saying, okay, you know what, you can take this patient to this hospital because we can see that this ventilator is, you know, vacant. We can say, okay, you know what, instead of taking this um, patient here, okay, you can move this ventilator from this hospital, this annex to this hospital for this patient. So that way we are offering solutions to the healthcare. So we don't necessarily have to be a standalone, you know, business on our own, but we have like, uh, we have a bedrock of technology that can help us monitor other businesses and help them put them in check. So at the end of the day, we are coming through the window, even though the shortage of most hospitals or most healthcare sectors understood that they were facing a primary problem, which is the shortage, the shortage of healthcare equipment and PPEs. But they also did not know that that was leading, or rather they know that that's leading them to financial loss. So they're not making as much as they would make because they cannot provide the solution. So we are saying, you know what, we're gonna come help your business to make sure that you're making maximum profit and you're managing the pandemic very well. So a hospital that you see that is managing the pandemic very well is a hospital that will be operative during the pandemic because they have a solution that keeps them running. So that's where we're coming in. So we have a bedrock of technology to help us do that. Thank you. And, and one aspect that you may consider looking at is some medical IoT and looking at how smart manufacturing and IoT can actually help with the problem that you're trying to solve. That's right. I would like to just add a little one thing is that uh, as Dr. Robin uh, asked, uh, I think also transparency between uh, intra-country and uh, uh, globally will help in that very well because, you know, if you are transparent in, in, in the uh, amount of, of production of like ventilators, uh, uh, what uh, what had happened from from one of the companies? Uh, I just want to uh, uh, the name of the company. I'm not I'm not remembering. They have put on the the uh, the source of uh, of manufacturing uh, publicly, and that was I think it was uh, one of the medical companies have done this, and that was a very good contribution from their side. Uh, so uh, transparency about uh, the capacity of uh, production and how uh, uh, this production could be done. Uh, I will tell you only a little story that Philips during the pandemic also have done a very good thing is that it assesses 
the amount of uh, infections in some countries and it directs its production more to the countries that in need. So that's something also uh, in communication that is needed to be done globally so uh, things can go smooth through uh, the right channels and the right need uh, for uh, in the supply chain. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you so no much. More questions. Thank you. Just in time, because I was just about to say that we have to cut this short so we can move forward to our um, next panelist. But thank you so much for your um, questions, panelists, and at the same time for the answers of our finalists. So now let us uh, proceed with uh, the final presentation from our um, last team, the foremost crew. Let me share my screen. Hi, good day. Here's our business case on pandemic proofing. And our business case is on Guess Incorporated, okay? Okay, so I'll be talking on the executive summary. So Guess Incorporated is a business that uh, is an amazing brand in the fashion industry. So the fashion business is like uh, every other industry was also uh, affected by the COVID-19 and the fashion industry was uh, faced a lot of um, issues in, it, in the pandemic. So Guest Incorporated is a 40-year-old company which was which started in 1981 and it's positioned itself for generations to come, okay? So here is uh, the overview for our studies. So first we did uh, a case study and we examined the current state of guests. Uh, we also looked at the issues facing the textile industry at large and the fashion industry. So we looked at, uh, we determined the goals for guests incorporated. And we looked at how to improve the business, how to prevent the business outcomes. We also proposed strategies for change and how to uh, implement these strategies, okay? So here is our presentation agenda. Uh, it covers areas on the problem statement, objectives, alternative courses of action, recommendations and implementation, and also the conclusion. So our team lead, in a sense, will be taking over from here. All right. So under our problem statement, so we want to ensure that Get Incorporated is a, a pandemic or disaster future-proof business without unsatisfied customers on happy employees or um, uh, reduce um, sales. So uh, so we are looking at um, reducing um, the effects of ex any external constraints. And under that, we are looking, we see that there is revenue loss due to COVID-19 and the customers are, uh, we are, are focusing on their health and not buying luxury products like Get Incorporated. And then also we, are, we look into the stores being shut down uh, and um, employees losing their job, leading to employees being um, unhappy. And then we also uh, look at the last one, which is um, a supply chain. Um, um, so many inventories are left unsold. Uh, and so, and then also um, production orders are also canceled. These are huge problems and we are looking forward to uh, finding solutions to it. So the next one with the next uh, segment taken by Lori. Yes, so our SMART objectives. So we looked at setting strategic priorities over the course of five years, and we concentrated on two places, business operations and customer engagement. And so with the first one, um, we've looked at it in terms of training. So we want to train 100% of divisional staff um, in emergency preparedness protocols by January 2022. And we also want to train the staff in virtually responsive selling and customer experience for four markets by January 2023. Because Guess is an international uh, company and, and, and they need to be able to respond digitally because that's the way the fashion industry is going. The other uh, is customer engagement. And so looking at implementing an AI responsive um, online shopping experience in four markets by January 2023 and looking at 100% of leads and customers virtually trying on the, um, the, the outfits they want to purchase, um, you know, through the augmented virtual reality by January 2022, hosting four online events um, each quarter for five years for the customers and increasing sales by 34% with direct consumer selling by January 2022. And 
The next section will be Innocent presenting alternative course of action. All right. So on our, on our alternative courses of action, so um, guests being traditionally focusing on um, uh, on uh, physical stores, we are looking at making the digital presence of guests incorporated more robust and also um, focusing on people. So diving in now, we're going to customer experience. So as mentioned by Lori, so we are going to implement um, direct to customer sales. Uh, and then um, augmented virtual reality for customers. We are looking at um, uh, creating a platform where customers can actually um, walk through a guest, a guest a store uh, and then upload their images and also try on um, items from guests to know which one really fits better. And this will improve the customer experience. The customer will feel, uh, feel that, okay, guest incorporated actually um, sees us as important and this will increase um, the brand loyalty for, for guests incorporated. And so looking at hosting virtual fashion um, events where customers are logging can actually get discounts um, uh, discounts, and then uh, implementing uh, artificial intelligence uh, chatbots so that um, customer service can be better because we see that reviews from the guest app is uh, uh, from customers. Uh, it seems like customers are not satisfied because they feel that the service there is actually terrible. But we're also looking at um, opening an innovation hub where customers can actually design um, um, design um, outfits that, uh, that fit their taste and other customers can vote for or against these designs and this will um, this will lead to our uh, producing get producing what was actually boosted for. So um, Next one, we are also going to look at um, business operations, where um, where employees from different units will actually uh, be trained as as emergency response team, and in turn train other um, employees in order to um, get prepared in case of any eventualities. And so, we are also embrace a zero based budget approach and just in time protocol. So, the next one is going to focus on the employees. So, we are going to make Gets operated a more agile organization by continuous training and also in terms of any eventualities, generating emergency funds to care for workers through car crowd sourcing. So next one, Lori. Yes. Yeah, so with recommendation and implementation. So how do we move from being a traditional retail storefront to a digital first um, experience for customers. And so the first thing we want to look at is feasibility and viability. So yes, is in fact um, viable. Um, they did have a 30% reduction in sales. However, they're still net positive. So we want to reallocate those funds to doing these, these courses of actions we recommended. For example, reallocating the marketing dollars for the storefront to the online um, uh, a shopping experience and then uh, uh, in the future going back and looking at the storefront as a place of an immersion experience for a lifestyle customer engagement. Um, we also are looking at reducing the liabilities with all those 100 stores that were closed for guests, reducing those um, lease and, and property tax liabilities to then giving that uh, all immersive e-commerce experience for customers. And of course, who sells, uh, them selling in Belgium is different than Hong Kong. So localization is important as well as AI enabled shopping. And uh, the next thing is the be, be, know, and do strategy. So theory of change and the, adjusting the change model, communicating with all stakeholders every step of the way, uh, providing the tools and modeling the processes from the management point of view to the employees and engaging in end user, end user focus groups like the innovation hub mentioned earlier by Innocent. And what does success look like? It looks like a more agile workforce, increased sales quarterly and annually, management coaching the employees, customers engaging in the channels across the supply chain virtually, and the staff being virtually ready to respond to the customers in a personal fashion lifestyle online. And um, what happens if they don't do this? They risk becoming irrelevant, losing customers, brand trash, and that's what's happening on the mobile app. Um, significant sale reduction, um, being outrun by digital first fashion companies, they can face acquisition and as a family started company, they may not want that. And of course, nobody wants to be bankrupt. So that concludes the this section. All right. So welcome our team. This is our team, Primoris Cantavit. Primoris Cantavit. And that's um, Latin for foremost crew. 
And so these are Tim, uh, Innocent, Joma, Lori, uh, and Jude. So we can see um, the various um, um, actions that were taken by both uh, by by each one of us. So we have Innocent taking innovation and B2B sales. Um, um, so Innocent uh, took a problem statement and course of action. Lori took the smart goals and implementation. Why Jude took the executive summary. And we are a diverse team in the sense that Innocent is a pharmacist, Lori is an e-learning, and Jude is an engineer. Thank you so much. We look forward to being in, in the final stage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was the presentation of our final uh, team, um, the foremost crew. So now let's proceed to our live Q&A. Do we have our um, finalists here? We have Innocent, we have Lori, and we have Jude. Okay, so the first question will be asked by Dr. Michael. May I call on Dr. Michael if he has any questions to ask our finalists? Hi team, uh, congratulations. I am impressed with how collaborative you were in your video presentation. And um, pretty much the same with other groups or with other teams. So you identified many elements in this case, but um, however, you, you actually benchmarked on specific company, which is guests. Why did you choose that particular business? What was the rationale of choosing guests in particular? Did guests have a particular challenge during during the pandemic or is someone yeah. currently connected to guests? So why did you choose the company? Yes, um, can everyone hear me? I'll take that question. Um, so we chose guests because they actually closed a hundred stores during the pandemic. Um, I mean, there was other stores that went bankrupt or closed down completely like Lord & Taylor and there's a couple others. So we felt like uh, to try to revive a, a company that is completely shut down might be too much of an ask in this uh, case study. So we tried to work with a company that was uh, international and global in, in, in scope, but they also um, needed some improvement because they lost um, significant sales and they also had to, to close down stores. So that's why we, that's, that's why they were highlighted to us as they were having a problem in during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, most of your uh, your your goals are actually smart. It, 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 those were you know stated in a, in the most succinct manner. And um, since there were many elements mentioned as well, I would like to know who are the process owners of these main courses of actions that you'd like to implement with guests? Because I think this would involve a lot of key people at the same time, mm -hmm. a lot of you know financial efforts for guests given the fact that they have already closed down a hundred of stores. So who, how do you think, uh, or who do you think are the process owner and how do you think guests would be able to cope with that financially? Yeah, so um, I think they should hire us as consultants. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, I think that um, when we look at how do we implement this and who would be the, the owners of this, we're looking at corporate gover governance and also looking at management. So if it doesn't go through the, the, the management uh, at the top, it's not going to flow through to every branch and every um, venture call of the of the company. Um, and so for us, it's looking at setting up a, a committees related to like the innovation hub, which is one of the solutions we had related to um, um, completely digitizing and what does it look like and, and creating those uh, key um, performance indicators around looking at um, what does it mean to be digitally first. Um, and so for us, it would be through a corporate governance where they would add to uh, committee to their board of directors and the board of directors and that committee would inform the management um, and if they need training or consultant they would get that to then the management team to be able to execute that so that's how we see it I don't know if that was too bird view response but I don't know if Innocent or Jude if you'd like to add to that okay so um, Lori can you talk about the partnership in terms of um, ventures who are already um, into our solutions if they are under well, yeah, so that I mean, so this is not completely unheard of. We actually, so going back to the first question you asked about 
if uh why do we choose guess it seemed like guess also was lagging mm -hmm. so when we look at like h m we look at mark and spencer um, we look at uh, Nike, they are really digitally responsive. Um, mm -hmm. If you are uh, Olympic uh, viewer fanatic like I am, what we found out that uh, a fashion house called Skims, which is like a Kardashian brand, they are digital first, but they secured um, the, they secured uh, basically, uh, what is it called? The partnership to uh, clothe all of the Olympians and even the para Olympians. And so this is a digital first two year company. And it's like, if guests wants to stay like uh, relevant, they need to sort of make this pivot. Um, I think they were originally a brother's company, a family basically oriented company, but because they've grown over, you know, the last 40 years, they really need to start making those pivots as they see the, the fashion industry making them. Otherwise they'll get left behind. Um, and so uh, there are companies like H&M, Nike, um, uh, Mark and Spencer, who are very digitally friendly towards their customers and even proactive and interactive in terms of, and Nordstrom, Nordstrom is an also an excellent example of just being ex extremely, like having fashion consultants uh, on standby for their cu customers so they can reduce uh, the return rate. You know, typical stores have like a 30, 60 day return policy. And so by allowing customers to uh, try on clothing, um, you know, even uh, virtually is still, um, something that customers are interested in because in the fashion industry, 62% of customers, while they shop online, they still actually uh, crave the trying on the clothes or trying on the shoes or the watch or whatever. So we still want to um, honor, you know, the whole point of this is to serve your, your clientele. And so I think that guest has done many things right, um, but they are, if they do not get on this bandwagon, they're going to be left behind. Perfect. I'm all good, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, team. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael. And now may I give the floor to um, our guest panelist, Mr. Zaid Salman, if you can hear us and if you have questions to our um, finalists. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, apologies. I'm having some technical problems, so I will not switch on my video. Uh, but can, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we yes, we can hear you. All right. All right. Fantastic. So thank you very much for the presentation. Very good. Very collaborative, uh, as was mentioned before. Um, a few questions on my side. You talk about um, brand relevance and, and um, uh, maintaining a connection with the brand. You know, as somebody who works in professional services, I'd be keen to know what does brand relevance mean? Uh, in the context of the company you looked at, Guess, uh, and what are some of the things that you think, um, in, based on your research, um, you need to be doing in order to build, build that brand relevance and connection with the customer base? Uh, Innocent, do you want to talk a little bit about the innovation hub and um, okay, like the right, virtual yes. fashion shows and stuff? Like I, I know yes. we mentioned it, but go ahead. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Okay, so um, guess as we said before was chiefly a traditional um, business um, focusing on their physical stores, and then the digital presence wasn't really robust. So we are trying to make digital presence. Um, better and in, in, in order to um to bring the stakeholders chiefly the customers closer to the business we uh, provide a solution in terms of um, innovation hub so in this sense we have um the innovation uh, platform innovation hub platform where customers can actually design outfits using different templates uh, online so they design the outfits and then other customers can actually vote for or against um, the, this outfit. And then the outfit that actually has the highest votes will be the one that um, Guess Incorporated will produce. In this sense, we, we, we would already have a customer base who wants to purchase that outfit even before it is made. So um, profit, making, making profits is guaranteed for Guess Incorporated if that is done. And at the same time, the customers feel um, uh, few important and um, they will be more they'll be closer to guests and of course brand loyalty will be there for guests um i don't know Lori, if you want to add something to that 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, this is like, like you all are saying, it's like such a, um, a huge endeavor to undertake, um, I think, with companies that are this big. Um, and so one of the other uh, courses of action that we had was for our, uh, I think the reason we didn't mention it too much is because Guess is actually already doing this. So they recognize brand relevance. Um, uh, this idea of bringing the fashion lifestyle to the customer and so having events related to fashion um, virtually, but then they, um, I think that if I were to recommend something to guess is to, to bring upon in that sort of like that same channel of virtual interactivity, um, looking at um, like lifestyle, cultural like thought around how their customers behave and like appealing to that. Um, and I think that if you empower your customers to, um, to inform your brand, you know, having focus groups, for example, um, uh, improving their mobile app. Their mobile app is a disaster compared to, let's say, like Nike. Um, and so I think this is really important for brand relevance when customers have like, you know, three seconds to, um, you know, they get online and they, you don't really get their attention for, for very long. And so you want to establish that relational uh, brand loyalty and keep increasing it over time to have that long-term uh, uh, customer life, uh, lifetime value um, and life cycle with that with that customer. Um, and you need to do that by coming to the channels that they are in. So if they're on social media, that's where you need to be. If they are, if they love to hop on Skype, that's where you need to be. Um, and so I think that that's extremely important to brand relevance. And when you can choose a pair of jeans from guests, but then you can also choose it from like a billion other different stores, including just getting something off of Amazon. Um, I think that companies in this uh, in this industry really need to think about how are they going to increase their market share and different, differentiate themselves from um, what's going on in order for them to stay competitive, have that competitive. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I was The point I was alluding to is around competitive differentiation. I'm sure you studied in strategy around the importance of differentiating company uh, in terms of products and services. Uh, so the Guess brand um, has a target customer base. I would imagine uh, mm -hmm. they are within a certain age range, they have a certain sort of um, uh, socioeconomic profile, a certain demographic and so forth. So presumably you've done the requisite research in order to identify who the guest target customer base is and mm -hmm. what, what they will do, you know, what are they looking for when they buy clothing? Uh, if it's right. the guest brand, I guess I presume um, fashion, uh, cost, uh, trends are some of the key purchase criteria. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right, yes. All right, okay. Um, and then just the second point, you talked about an engaged workforce. Uh, this, is very, this is a very common trend now across companies. Um, what, what, based on your research, uh, will keep an, an, a workforce motivated, um, willing to contribute to a company, especially in such you know, uncertain times, and also when the war for talent continues? I mean, I'm sure you've read that you know, demand for good people um, is, you know, stronger than ever. Uh, and so it's no longer the case where an employee is beholden to the company, you know, for his or her livelihood. You know, now they have more choice. They have more flexibility. Um, and, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if an employer doesn't provide them with what they're looking for, they can go somewhere else very quickly, very, very easily. So what on your, in your research, when you talked about, an engaged and motivated workforce, do you think, from your perspective, are the key levers that will um, incentivize your employees? These are all okay. great questions. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jude. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I think I'll take this first. So for one of the motivational forces that we need for guests incorporated needs to um, keep their workers staying and happy is uh, welfare. So they are welfare to their employees has been pretty okay, but it's not really much compet um, competitive with the likes of the other brands, other big brands in their simple fashion industry. For Nike, sometimes they take their, their staffs on trainings 
outside the country. They take their staff out of their comfort zone where they are not regular workplaces, and they take them out to places where they can get an entirely different training. And this, sometimes this training with, that has to do with uh, the pandemic and um, anything that has to do with COVID or the likes that will come, these are some of the things that they can take them elsewhere to train them, tell them about how they can work on themselves, um, build themselves and build uh, an emergency response team and ERT that will respond to uh, any, any um, upcoming, um, um, pan some, something like a pandemic that will come up again. So this, in this way, they'll be able to like respond to it quickly and better. They'll be kind of prepared for it. So another way is um, training, like intense training. So they'll have an intense training for all staff you have a member from every team that will be in they'll be part of the emergency response training in the entire division so once um, the training is being done with the emergency response team then each member will go back to their team and also train their staff once this is done it will be done quarterly within um every, once in every three months and once this is done it will kind of prepare the staff and the entire organization on the long run for something like this that might come up again. So once this happens, they'll be able to like respond. They will know what to do at a certain point in time. They'll be able to plan themselves better financially. Yes, it does. My, my only, my only um, comment is that all of what you said is good, but that will impact your margins at the end of the day, because training is not free. Um, mm -hmm. Professional development and you know, mentorship and all of that, great ideas. In, in practice, companies always have a challenge with this because they need their employees to do their day job uh, and they also need to return margins to their shareholders. So mm -hmm. it's a balancing act at the end of the day. <laughs> Perhaps maybe, I don't know if this, if this is beyond the scope of this exercise, but you know, you, how would you consider managing that? Was it going to be around setting up the company in terms of specific cost centers, managing training and development, or are you, would you be looking at some other way of uh, providing training in a cost-effective manner? Yeah, providing training also, we're also looking at uh, marketing, like more of digital marketing to help to publicize the organization more than the regular traditional marketing platform that guests is used to. And that will, in turn, um, help them with more sales. They'll be able to uh, have more sales and their production will, on the long run will come up way better than it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, 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 oh, go ahead, go ahead, Innocent. Okay, so let's add into that. Uh, you were asking how we can save uh, money for the um, company in terms of training. So in terms of training, mm -hmm. um, the, the emergency response team will only have um, uh, perhaps one employee in each unit that will be trained um, at the, at the, to be an outsource training to um, get them set to um, uh, profile policies and um, steps to, to handle any um, eventualities or disasters that, disaster that may come in the future. Now, with these um, few employees that were trained, they will come into their own units and then retrain and then train other team members such that um, only few members will act, only few employees will actually be trained, uh, will, will, will have these costs going to an external provider. So after a few is trained, those, go, those few that were trained will go back to their units and also train every other person. So that way, um, your cost can be reduced in terms of training. Yes. Um... And I'd like to add a couple of things as you asked like a magnanimous, an excellent question, magnanimous one. And I think it, when we look at the fashion industry, um, I think sustainability and transparency and care for stakeholders besides customers. So besides customers and, and shareholders, such as the employees is going to become paramount. And it's starting to kind of do that shift with looking at sustainability, sustainability goals. Um, and so I do think that when you look at a company like Guess, if they want to set themselves apart and keep those employees that are hardworking and are talented, they are going to have to invest in uh, their employees um, and they're gonna to have to do it in some creative ways. Uh, one of the solutions that we came up with was for them to do a kind of uh, community-based crowdsourcing to help, for example, employees or even 
uh, manufacture workers who are connected to the, the brand of Guess um, in terms of production. Um, for, for them to have like this ability to, if, let's say something happens in their community, let's say, I don't know, they're hit by a tornado, or let's say if you're talking about staff that's in office, maybe there was a, you know, a loss in someone's family that people are able to actually give to um, the cause of helping each other as employees and workers within the guest community. Um, and I think that that's something that is a little bit different. I think that, uh, and, and I feel like there's a way that the model can be presented in such a way that yes, that the, the funds essentially go to employees and workers uh, but the sources can be uh, diverse in terms of where the funding is coming from. So it doesn't necessarily have to come out of um, guesses bottom line. It could come out of um, uh, storytelling and people uh, giving and donating towards that, um, that idea, that thought culture of we care for each other. And so that's another culture shift that, you know, that's probably a, a case in and of itself. But I think that when you look at, for example, what happened with the pandemic, people lost uh, family members. And so like, how do you really address that without being insensitive? Um, and so I think that's one of the ways you can do that, but then also just think of your employee as a whole um, and start to, I think that if you have something like that in your organization, employees are gonna really think about, wow, like management cares, the shareholders actually care about me. Um, and so they will, I think just thinking of like psychology or thought behavior, they will probably be not very interested in just jumping to another uh, company to work for. Um, so that's just, I don't know, those are my thoughts. Uh, Zaid, I don't know if we've, we've answered your questions. No, it's good, it's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. No, thank no you. More questions. No more questions from my side, thank you. Thank you, Zaid. And uh, maybe one final question from our um, panelists. May I call on Dr. Noel? Do you have any questions for the team? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, congratulations on getting this far. Very good. Very nice work. Thank you. Right. Um, so let me ask, as it's related to, um, you know, the I think the pandemic, right? And, and the, the overall um, point, I think, in this, um, I think a lot of this, what we're already talking about, is evolving and morphing as a result of, of just changing times and e-commerce, right? And sort of the fashion industry having to sort of move along with those trends. Um, so I will say, you know, why guess, um, as opposed to looking at broader fashion industry, you know, why specifically guess? Why guess after the pandemic? Um, just, just if you could hit on that for just a moment. Well, uh, I think I, uh, I talked a little bit about this before, but so the e-commerce uh, sector or industry, if you will, um, is like a $3.53 uh, trillion dollar industry. And this mm -hmm. is e-commerce is where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if guests can really tap into that, that's fantastic because they have not done a great job in terms of mobile responsiveness, their app, like their mobile app um, and the online shopping experience. When you go to markandspencer.com or um, uh, nordstrom.com, there's really amazing customized options for, for customers mm -hmm. to um, you know, have that shopping experience. And guess it's very basic. It's kind of like where we were maybe in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And there are, they are making some strides and, I, and we, we believe that you know, if they're able to implement um, even one or two of these solutions that we're proposing, it mm -hmm. will dramatically change the outset, the outlook that they have even for their profit margins. Yes, would it require an investment? Sure, you know, they would have to invest um, some dollars into what it looks like to train, what it looks like to become digitally um, uh, dynamic, um, mm -hmm. but it will pay off because this is, this is the future of fashion. The future of fashion is very much um, lifestyle immersion um, and very digital. So I think uh, what drew us to guess is the idea, is the, the fact that they, like weren't quite there yet. It's kind of like they needed that nudge to turn the corner to pivot. Um, and where and, and what was so great is that there are other examples of, of businesses in the fashion industry and in the textile industry that are making those strides in their own ways and they are successful. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why we focused on guests. 
So it seems like though that most that most of what you're talking about, you know, is is things that any company I think would need to um, be accounting for and face in in, in competitive markets, you know, and really um, organizational improvement, in, you know, across a variety of um, areas, you know, including their own employee engagement and those kinds of things, you know. Um, one thing that really stood out to me though that um, seemed like a game changer for e-commerce and for fashion in e-commerce, right, in, in that changing environment was the technology that you were mentioning mentioning um, uh, inv involving a virtual try on. Uh, that's mm -hmm. huge, that's a big uh, deal. And you know, that is something that I think with, with the first company that comes out with that, everybody's gonna try to take it after that, you know? Um, right. But could you explain more of your thoughts around the virtual try on? Um, you know, is that like a, where somebody, you know, just kind of, you know, submits their picture and it puts the clothes on them? Or is this sort of like, what is your thought around the virtual try on process? Because that is game changing technology in fashion. And that would be if guests could own that, that would be something that later on, you know, becomes very, very successful outside of just things like organizational improvement, right? And, and, mm -hmm. you know, sustainable competitive advantage, you know, looking at what your, you know, what your competition's doing, that piece is, is critical, right? So if you could talk a little bit more about that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Innocent, do you want to start? And maybe I'll, I'll finish with that one. Okay, so, um, so the, um, the AVR, Augmented Virtual Reality. So we're looking at um, in, uh, the, the business cases, making guests incorporated, uh, future proof, pandemic proof, disaster proof. So in case we have situation again, like COVID-19, COVID where customers cannot as, um, get access to the physical stores. So we want to have a, um, make it seem like real in the sense that um, customers can actually walk through a guest incorporated store, um, mm -hmm. upload their image, their full image, try on, click on, um, on, on, the, on, on the outfits and try it on so they know how it fits actually. And then um, uh, Guest Cooperated might not be a technology-based um, company. And so this mm -hmm. would be outsourced. So Lori will tell us about how to outsource it actually. So um, okay. to, to continue answering this question, so how would this like, what, wow, this is amazing for me to try something on in, the, in, in you know, in my living room or even in my bathroom. <laughs> Um, uh, so in practical terms, uh, this idea that we, that guests would need to, uh, uh, basically look at the various solutions out there, third-party solutions. So there are in fact companies, um, there's a couple in India and there's one prominent one in the UK that specifically focuses on AVR solutions for fashion. Um, so there, so, so guests would not be perhaps the first. Um, they would not be able to necessarily own this technology unless they bought out one of these technology uh, uh, firms. Um, but uh, with the ability to be, to work with the third party uh, so, uh, party, the vendor, they would be able to train their staff and how to then like do virtual consulting, virtual selling. So this would change that dynamic and then get uh, the AVR uh, ability in the hands of the customers. And some of the ways they can do that would probably be another type of B2B partnership. So for example, um, looking at, uh, you know, a promotional sponsorship with a company like Samsung or something and where, you know, maybe some of the technology would be provided, but, you know, then you have the, the UK vendor who has the ability to help guests implement it, but then guests is at the forefront. So there's, I think there's different ways that they could, you know, the, the, the management and the corporate governance could look at it and say, we have option A, B, and C and assess their, um, you know, their, their profit margin, their liquidity, like, can we invest in this? And, you know, what do we project the, the, the returns to be? Um, and so, uh, you know, it is possible. And I think that it would really take them to basically change their minds from the top down um, in terms of looking at this as the future of uh, fashion. And, and, and some of the things that I really admire about uh, companies that have thrived in this uh, pandemic 
um, is that they have been able to just make some unlikely partnerships, like partnerships, you'd be like, oh, I would never have thought that, you know, so-and-so could could link up and do this amazing and produce this amazing promotional, uh, give this uh, uh, amazing customer value to their customer base. But because they thought outside the box, because they pivoted, you know, they were able to do something that's, you know, that not everyone else is doing. And so there is a, a, a chance for guests to do that. Um, even different than Nike, H&M, Nordstrom. Uh, but it's a matter of like, I think the management has to kind of pivot and make that decision. Okay, so uh, Jude, can you talk about the, uh, the uh, cost estimates? Hello, Jude. Yeah, he's on um, mute. He just needs to change the mute. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Hi. So for the, the cost estimates, we budgeted around uh, about 6.2 million, which will cover the uh, AVR, the trainings, that will cover everything that has to do with in the marketing, online marketing, digital marketing, everything that has to do with the publicity and sales. So Guest is already a big brand, right? So, but they'll need more uh, digital marketing, more sales and more publicity online more than what they usually do in their, um, their physical traditional stores. So prior to this time, one out of every nine guest stores has been affected, like we're, we're shut down. But during this period, um, we did, with this method. Oh, this is long run. So for the cost, if the, the 6.2 million, part of it is going on training, Part of it is going on marketing, more digital marketing than the regular traditional marketing they've been used to. The likes of ad, um, adverts on Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, on more on Google, uh, more platforms than the traditional method they've been used to. So they'll do more adverts and they will do more uh, training, more in-depth training. Uh, the equipment will be bought. Uh, there will be expenses, and this training will also go down to that of their staff. And on the long run, they, once these staffs are trained. And something like this happens uh, anytime from now again, they'll be able to like work from home or wherever they'll have to work from and they'll be able to like um, cover whatever expenses they have. So on, on the general breakdown, once they train um, for cost, the AVR for videos, those are part of the things that will cover the cost. One of the, another thing that will also uh, um, have uh, cost coverage is ad, um, adverts like, uh, like vid uh, videos on, on um, TV, well, one of the main things is like that of uh, Pepsi. Pepsi had one in Nigeria during this um, pandemic, this during the lockdown. So Pepsi did an ad that everyone at home, they'll be able to like party on Tango this Friday kind of thing. Yes, the paid presenters, dancers and singers, you, everyone will connect. And when you, once you connect from home, you'll be able to like um, dance with them with, with a bottle of Pepsi with you because they will, um, will be, will be these products and sell to you. So for guests, what they'll be able to do is they'll be able to like partner with people online. They'll be able to watch and view some of these. These are all paid adverts. So this will take a lot of the expenses in part of the cost. So they'll be able to like connect with the people. They'll be able to like um, organize from their sitting rooms, from their parlor, they'll be able to, to wear guest brands. They will, with the use of the AVR, they'll be able to like go through the stores, select a, brand, a product they want, the kind of clothes they want to wear, the kind of outfit, they'll be able to design the kind of outfit they want. Once that is done, then you, um, you'll be able to wear it. You show it on your, on your TV, on your own platform, the way it is programmed. You show it on your own platform and you'll be able to work and model within your house and you'll be connected. Your camera will be connected to you and it will be shown live globally. So once that is done, um, the products that has, the, the product that has been selected, those brands with the highest number of will be the next um, um, products that will be released. So once those products are released, they'll be the next um, product or brands that um, guess is actually bringing out to the market. So people will know that then subsequently they'll be able to like partner with the um, guests online to be able to connect to them with their videos. So once this even happens, guests will even gain more publicity because people will be looking out to guests. They'll be looking out to like partner with guests to be able, looking out to like model with them and, and be able to buy their products. Other kind of like, but since they are the first, do stand out and their, their sales will be really um, uh, massive. It will be way more better than what they normally earn. So I think their production will really go so well. So it really helps to boost.
um yes very good very good blessed will be the company that comes up with that technology <laughs> we hope it's guess <laughs> but for real that would be fantastic um you know to be able to have your friends virtually watch you try things on uh would be an absolute game changer in e-commerce fashion <laughs> so very nice work very nice thank you Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our uh, distinguished panelists and to our finalists. Now, in respect to everyone's time, we will be um, we will be responding to some of the questions that were posted by our audience and our uh, participants. So we will only be choosing one question to be responded by one e uh, one team member for each team. So please, uh, uh, we'll only be assigning one uh, one of the team one of the team members to answer, and then please make your responses as short as possible because uh, we're mm -hmm. running out of time, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's begin with the group or with the third group since we have them here already. So uh, one of the questions that were um, asked for you is, um, would guests not lose out on customers and revenue from remote areas where internet connectivity and speeds are poor when they go fully digital? This was asked by Bubele Zote, one of our um, audience members. Anyone from the team can answer? You want me to take, hello? Lori, would you like to respond? Lori, Lori you can't go oh, on this. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, I actually, I for, forgot the top of the question. I'm so sorry, uh, could you ask? No like, problem. So okay, no problem, let me repeat it. Would guests not lose on customers and revenue from remote areas where internet connectivity and speeds are poor when they go fully digital? Yes, and I think this is like a, pandemic wide or digital wide issue and I think that there's things that you can do there's something called localization which not just addresses like a, uh, the the language or culture of a region but then also looking at compatibility and accessibility so it you know so this maybe is something that guests could maybe purchase a tech company that is able to do this for them but looking at how do you make your interface um quite hybrid for folks who have like the, the the speed internet the fios but then also for people who um do not have like the same uh download and upload speed but they could still have a similar experience so i think that's actually a problem to solve in the fashion industry but then also just across like when you are trying to sell online um so hopefully i answered your question thank you Okay, thank you so much, Lori. Now I'll entertain a question for the pandemic fighters. We have them here as panelists. So one of the questions for you guys is, um, you talked about transparency. What solution would you propose to make countries more transparent, cooperative, and humane during various life cycles of a pandemic? Looks like the World Health Organization could not do much in this regard. And by life cycle, I mean stages and phases of a pandemic. That was asked by Sunday Bamsa. Let me answer this question. Actually, as you know, uh, transparency is an act of, of, uh, of individual uh, moral and and values it's, it's it needs certain values to be done it's the same i'm, I'm looking at it uh, the same like the the uh, the climate change actions we are taking as uh, uh, as a part of our uh, of our uh, sustainability uh, responsibility to the nature so i think this should be uh, dealt with the same there should be organizations global organizations who uh, lead this uh, kind of transparency, uh, especially during uh, pandemics and uh, global crisis. So, uh, frankly speaking, you are not going to to uh, force any of the countries on, or even any of the organizations to be 100% uh, transparent about their production, about uh, any data uh, in the country, uh, like the number of uh, infections, whatever. But as we as we progress in the in, in our uh, society's civilization, you see now how people are trying to work more with their uh, uh, reducing their carbon footprint. Uh, so it, it will be the same. We need some organizations who can uh, lead this and drive the way to uh, make trans transparency in, in the uh, uh, global crises uh, much better 
and works uh, uh, for the prosperity of uh, the lives and saving lives of the whole uh, globe. Okay, thank you so much. And finally, we have here a question for the CEO team. Um, uh, how do they come up with a whooping amount of $1 million as operational cost? Okay, anyone from the team can answer the question. Okay, um, thanks for the question. I think that's from Pios. Well, the $1 yes, million that was Pius. stated, yes, it wasn't for the operational costs right? It's the projected revenue for the three years after launch. And we derived that by looking at the healthcare revenue in 2018 and projecting a 0.1% of that revenue. So if you can get that transaction into Kure Hub in the next three years, then that's the projected revenue for Kure Hub. I hope that clarifies. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. So now before you know, before we proceed with the live voting, the very important part of this uh, presentation or this event, uh, let's just have a very quick recap of the presentations of the team. So let me go back to sharing my screen with everyone. Okay. So we had earlier, um, okay, let me go back to that a presentation from the CEO team wherein they focus, of course, on the healthcare system through building an application. Team members um, coming from Nigeria and Indonesia. Then we also have the pandemic fighters, uh, which focus on the holistic approach to, um, to solving issues in the hospital business and the healthcare business. We have team members from Egypt and Nigeria. And finally, we have the foremost crew uh, focusing on the fashion industry. We have team members from Nigeria and the USA. And now, since we are done with, uh, with our uh, presentation of the uh, of each team we will now be jumping to the important part of this session which is the uh, live voting session for this competition but before i open the, the poll session let me just share with you the questions that you will be encountering so we have four questions that you'd like uh, that you would have to vote for the first question would be for the team member with the highest impact and potential to earn the championship title so note that the team member with uh, the team rather that with highest number of votes will be declared as our first place winner to be followed by the second and the third placers and then we will also be awarding the special awards for the most diverse team or the team with the most diverse team members including geographic diversity and then the most creative presentation for the team who presented their case using the most creative and unique approach and the most innovative strategy or the team who presented the most innovative solution to the main problem of the case study. So let me stop sharing my screen and I will be opening the, um, the polls or the live voting. You will be prompted with questions on your screen. This is for the webinar attendees. So all you have to do is to choose which among the teams you think would be, um, would be fit for the specific uh, criteria. Let me begin the uh, polling now. Okay, you should be seeing it on your screen. And then let's begin with our timer here. I'll be giving you one minute to vote for your uh, chosen team members. Okay. I just want to make sure that I know which team. Um, the foremost crew is our team for um, medical CRM and ERP, correct? The foremost crew is our team for uh, the, the guests, the, the fashion industry, the okay. CS team, the one with our, uh, for our um, healthcare system, then the pandemic fighters, the second presenters. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. We have 30 seconds left to vote. Okay, we can now see the, uh, the uh, voting coming in. 41% have voted. Okay, 46% have cast in their votes. We have 10 seconds left for the voting process. Okay, keep voting if your vote's coming. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, time is up. Let me end the polling. We have received 70% 70 70 of the population have voted. 
And now, while our uh, learner success manager is tallying the votes, so let me just give you a very quick, um, you know, overview of the prizes for our, uh, you know, special awards. Let me show that. For our special award prizes, each team member will receive a $50, $50 uh, word gift certificate from Amazon. That is for each of the members of the group for uh, to be awarded as most diverse team, most creative presentation, and most uh, innovative strategy. So uh, may I now call on our learner success manager, Trisha Rocket, to award our winners for the special awards. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry that took a while. Okay, so I'm very excited to announce um, the winners for our Business Case Challenge 2021. But first of all, I want to congratulate everyone, all the participants. We're all very impressed by all their case studies. We're very happy to see that you're all um, able to apply what you've been learning in your courses. And most importantly, you know, it's a very um, exciting for us to see how um, innovative and how bold you all are as NXT learners. We're all very happy with that. So now uh, let me begin by um, presenting who is the most innovative, uh, the team with the most innovative strategy. Okay, so, uh, okay, so from the 71% who voted within this group, 53% voted the foremost crew as the most innovative, as the team with the most innovative strategy. Okay, congratulations. congratulations. I know it you here. Congratulations <laughs> to the foremost crew. Okay, and then now let's go to the team who got the most vote for the most creative presentation. Okay, and now they garnered 56% um, of the vote. And Okay, so we have the foremost crew as well. Congratulations, it's a landslide. Okay. And then lastly, we have 51% um, who voted for the team that is the most diverse, meaning the ones who have um, teams from different countries as well. And 51% uh, voted again for the foremost crew. Congratulations to everyone in the foremost crew. It's a landslide. Okay. And then now let's begin with the um, third placer for the, um, <coughs> excuse me, NXU Business Case Challenge. Um, okay, let me see here. Okay, there. So for our the third place, we have the Pandemic Fighters, the team of the Pandemic Fighters from Team 07614. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. Great. Just Congratulations. to share with you the, the awards for them, they will be receiving a one-year Blinkist premium subscription for all of the team members, one personal branding coaching session also for the team members, and of course, the third place certificate. Once again, congratulations. Thank you so much, Jamie. Okay, I'm so very happy to see all the love from the group. Okay, that's good. Okay, now let's... Um, okay. Let me just look at the poll once again for uh, the second place. Okay, we don't have a drum roll here, but in any case, you know, I know that we've already built up the suspense already. So for the second placer, we have the SEO team, Team 25878. Congratulations, everyone. That means that our champion for the NXU Business Case Challenge is the foremost crew. Congratulations. Let me invite them back in in the group so that you know you can give everyone your um, final speech for the group okay so uh, Jamie, um, thank you, can you have them back okay okay well while you're while we're processing that let me just share with the audience our awards and prices for the second place we have a one-year quillbot premium subscription for the members one business consulting session for each of the three members and of course a second place certificate and of course finally for our champion or our for our first placers they will receive a six month 50 percent discount voucher for their uh, tuition fees 
one year Grammarly premium subscription for each of the three team members, one year CMI membership for each of the three team members, one business consulting session with a business consulting expert for each of the three team members, and of course, their first place certificate. So do we have them here on the call? Uh, maybe we can hear any, uh, uh, any you know, <laughs> words from the members of our champion, the foremost crew. Yeah, I think we have them in the call. I can see Lori here with us and Innocent. Lori, you're on mute. Let me unmute your mic. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Oh my goodness, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm like trying not to tear up. This was like a lot of hard work. Like, um, so none of us in the group um, have any fashion experience besides like buying. <laughs> So um, it was like a lot of hard work just to like understand the fashion industry, understand the textile industry, like the supply chain. It was just, it was so much. So I, it was a lot of late nights, a lot of like, at one point, I think we were like going back and forth if we wanted to even do the fashion because we just didn't know enough. Um, we were like, oh, maybe we should like do something we're all comfortable with. Um, um, so anyway, so I don't know if um, Innocent and Jude are here, but I'd love for them to to say something. And until then, just thank you all so, so, so much. Um, thank you and congratulations to the other competitors. I thought those were absolutely formidable. Um, you know, I have friends who work in the healthcare industry and I can completely see how those innovative strategies would actually be huge. Um, especially in like more like remote or like areas that people just wouldn't think of affected by something like the pandemic. I think these, these would be game changers, but anyway, thank you all so much. We are, we're so blessed. Um, Innocent Jude, are you all here? You want to say something? Innocent was our team leader. So he kept us, he was, he was the, you know, the captain of the ship. So, uh, I don't know if they're on. I think they're having technical um, issues, but then again, oh, Jamie. Okay. But it's okay. okay. Maybe he just needs to unmute, maybe. Let me try to unmute him. Innocent, can you uh, can you try to speak now? Oh, he's not accepting the unmute request. It's okay. Well, anyway, thank you so much for your words, um, Laurie. And uh, just for the sake of transparency, let me just quickly show you the uh, results, the actual poll results, so that you'll know okay. that um, these are the actual results. So let me share it to you now. Do you guys see the actual poll, uh, poll results? Okay, so as you can see there, uh, our winners are clearly the foremost crew. So once again, thank you so much and uh, a huge congratulations to all of our um, winners. And to formally close this event, um, I would like to call on our Chief Learning Officer, Dr. Robin Johnston. Thank you, Jamie Beth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. This was awesome. It was such a wonderful opportunity to experience this final step in your competition journey. And congratulations to all. You all did such a great job. Throughout this competition, you've gained lots of new skills. You built new connections and relationships. You've demonstrated your creativity, your communication, problem solving abilities and really challenge yourself and others towards a goal and a passion to future-proof and build a sustainable world. John Richardson Jr. said, and I quote, when it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people, those who let it happen, those who make it happen, and those who wonder what happened. Well, you all are making it happen. NXU has given you the opportunity to develop a growth mindset, adapt to change, learn to learn, and implement the learning immediately and in the future. Take every facet of this journey as an experience to realize your true potential, find your passion and your joy and open a world for you according to your dreams and your wishes. It's important to understand the power of you and the collective you. So what's next? Your work in this competition is not over because you just entered a competition. You have taken a huge step towards your education now it's time to take a giant step in your career. I challenge you to present to your current employer or use this as an artifact, something that you could demonstrate your skills to a potential employer. You have the tools to succeed, adaptable, lifelong learning, agility, creativity, communication, and problem solving skills will not only future-proof a business during a pandemic and our challenging times, 
but also create the capabilities you need to future-proof yourself. Again, congratulations and have an inspired and amazing weekend. And thanks for everything. You guys are great. Thank you, Dr. Robin. And once again, thank you everyone for attending and participating in this event. Congratulations once again to all of our competition winners. And I encourage everyone to stay engaged and be part of our different university learning communities. Join our different WhatsApp group to stay connected and stay tuned for more exciting programs and learner competitions that will soon be, that will soon be launching. So once again, this is Jamie and I'm wishing everyone the best. Have a wonderful rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Bye.